Victoria Santa Lobos joined Pomona College as the Sarah Rempel and Herbert S. Rempel, 23, Director of the Benton Museum of Art at Pomona College in January, January 2020. Lobos also serves as Associate Professor in Pomona, Pomona's Art History Department. Prior to her work at the Benton, Lobos worked for the Art Institute of Chicago in a variety of curatorial and administrative roles. In September 2019, she completed a multi-year project related to the museum's holdings of Dutch and Flemish drawings, culminating in a scholarly catalog and exhibition of the same name. Before the Art Institute, <clears throat> Lobus worked for four years as the inaugural cur curator of the print collection at the University of San Diego. She has also held curatorial internships and fellowships at the J. Paul Getty Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Lobos was also a member of the 2018 Fellows Cohort at the Center for Curatorial Leadership. She received her BA from Yale College and her MA from Williams College, and her PhD from Columbia University, where she wrote her dissertation on workshop practice in the time of Peter Paul Rubens. She has curated and co-curated exhibitions across a broad geographical and historical range, including projects treating medieval manuscript illuminations, early modern prints and drawings, the serial Latin, Latin American painting, Wischler and his influence, modern and contemporary Latin American works on paper and contemporary American drawings. She has also published in the fields of contemporary artists, books, and contemporary American photography. Please join me in welcoming Victoria Sancho Lopez. Hello, thank you, Keenan, and um, welcome to all of you fellow Williams alumni. I'm delighted to be with you today and can't wait for the time when I can be welcoming you here in our galleries in person. We are standing in the entrance lobby of the brand new Benton Museum of Art at Pomona College. This is a purpose built space that uh, was completed in 2019 and has yet to open to the public. So you are among the very first to get a look inside our galleries at our first series of exhibitions. So what I thought we would do today is something fairly informal. I will walk through a few of our gallery spaces, those that have been installed and particularly our two marquee exhibitions, Alia Ali Project Series 53, part of which you see behind me, and Alison Saar of Ether and Earth. As I go through, please feel free to ask questions. I'm going to count on Keenan to interrupt me as we go through and voice your questions um, or invite you to, to speak on your own behalf. So I'll just begin with the wall behind me. I'm gonna move out of the way and maybe approach the space so you can see a little bit more clearly what we're looking at. So for our inaugural series of exhibitions, we decided to commission the artist Alia Ali to realize a four-part exhibition. And what you're seeing is one of those four parts. This is a wall installation. I think you're seeing almost all of it. I'm going to move toward it now so you can see some in a little bit greater detail. And I hope you can perceive that this installation comprises a wall painting. The entire wall is painted with an, an Arabic symbol that you also see repeated in the photographic prints that are affixed to the wall. So there are five photographic prints. Each one has its own wall that includes the same symbol. And then in front of the wall rendered in the photographs, you see veiled figures and they are draped with a textile that itself is decorated with this Arabic symbol. The symbol is the Arabic word for love, which is pronounced khab. And it was the artist's intention to subvert many popular associations with the Arabic language. Um, in recent years, particularly after September 11th, the um, visual associations in the West, especially with the Arabic language, 
have tended toward um, a, connotations of, of violent conflict. And so it was the artist's intention here to uh, manifest an Arabic symbol that expresses the idea of love. And we've, uh, this was the very first work that we installed in this space. I'll just add um, that the building that we're standing in, I, I'll hope that you'll get some of our architectural features as we go through. This building was designed by Machado Silvetti with Gensler. Many of you may be familiar with Machado Silvetti's work. They're a Boston-based firm. They also realized the College Art Museum at um, Hamilton College, the Welland Museum, and we're delighted that they worked with us on this project. My predecessor, Kathleen Stewart Howe, shepherded the design and construction of the building, and it's now um, my great delight to envision how we will fully occupy and activate this space. I'm going to take you around the corner to see another of the works from this particular exhibition. So the artist Alia Ali is um, of Yemeni Bosnian descent. She was educated here in the United States at another uh, small liberal arts college. She's a graduate of Wellesley College. And she um, has lived in several countries, including Germany, Morocco, um, she recently completed her MFA here in Southern California in the Cal Arts program, and she's now completing a residency in Roswell, New Mexico. So I am showing you, let me see if I can give you a view. This is the north-south axis of our building. We call this the Art Hall. And in the Art Hall, we have installed six uh, photographic composite pieces also by Alia Ali. I'm going to show you two of them right now. They're from the series Flux that was realized in 2019. So we're turning around to see two of the works from the Flux series and I'll try to approach so you can see one in some greater detail. So similar to the love installation that we just looked at in our foyer, these pieces also uh, feature draped or veiled figures. And uh, the artist has been making these works for a number of years, sometimes with plain backdrops. In this case, you see a more elaborate. When she began making these works, she herself served as the model, she would uh, drape herself. And in all cases, the figures are completely drailed or vape, uh, veiled or draped so that um, no facial features are perceptible. Um, in this case, a little different from uh, a series that she, that she created that was called Borderlands. In this series, the Flux series, we have the same photographic panels um, and the same interest in textiles. But in this case, the photographic textile is set within a fabric wrapped frame. I'm gonna get a little closer and see if I can point that out for you to uh, perceive a little bit more clearly. So if you see um, my hand here, this is the limit of the photographic print and the artist has then set it within a fabric covered frame. So um, in both of these, works in the love piece and also in the flux series, we can appreciate her interest in pattern and textile and perhaps in the flux series, a special interest in um, the craft of uh, textile design. Ali Ali uh, made a point of completing apprenticeships with textile masters in a number of different um, geographic locations, including Mexico, Java, um, and also in Morocco, and uh, we see this interest carried throughout her work. So in addition to um, this, this series, I wanted to uh, show you 
Another part of this exhibition, which I mentioned is a four part exhibition. We have the Lev installation in our foyer, the Flex series in the art hall. Um, toward the end of our time together, I will show you an entire room installation that features a film. And then we also have a work, um, a film that is um, available only on our website. So if you look at our website, you will see Alia Ali's film titled Conflict is More Powerful Than Peace. Before we go on to other galleries, I will just give you a look out into our courtyard. And I think Keenan is sharing a link to our website and where you can find more information about the artist. I'm going to um, show you. So this is, we're looking east now and you see our indoor outdoor space. We have a, a pavilion where we can have events. I'm not sure that appears in the frame or if you'll be able to see it. I'm gonna rotate just a little bit. I think you can see perhaps just a little bit um, on the far edge of the screen. This is our um, art pavilion where we can do pop-up exhibitions. We can have screenings, events. We are delighted to be in sunny Southern California where we can open the doors entirely. Um, so it can be an open air space contiguous with the courtyard that you see. And I wanted to show you this in part to also show off our site specific commission by the artist, Allison Saar. I'm hoping that this will appear clearly in view and Keenan will have to tell me if it is visible or if I'm obscuring it with these pillars. Um, but the exhibition that we're about to walk into features the work of Allison. Can you, can you see what I'm pointing out? It's, um, she's the, hiding behind a pillar the there. Let's see if we can get her into view. Ah, I think she's starting to yeah. appear, yes. Right there. Um, so here, I think just over um, my hand, you can see at least a glimpse of our site-specific commission, which is titled Imbue, again, by the artist Allison Saar. We were thrilled that this work and the artist uh, were recently featured in the New York Times, a big piece by Jory Finkel. And uh, this is a work uh, created out of bronze. It has this green patina, which is intentional. And we like to joke that we were saved a good bit of um, anguish because I'm sure many of you know that bronze uh, tends to oxidize and turn into this color. So starting out with this as the intended appearance is uh, lovely for us. We don't have to try to reverse this effect. This is indeed the desired, the desired look. So the artist, Alison Saar, may be familiar to some of you. She's from a very artistic family. The, um, her, her mother has recently been celebrated with monographic exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art, as well as the Morgan Library and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Her name is Betty Saar. Alison Saar's father, Richard Saar, was also an artist, a ceramicist, and an art conservator. And uh, her sister, Leslie Saar, is also an artist. So we were delighted that Allison agreed to create the site-specific commission. As you can see, it, it is um, placed quite intentionally among these natural grasses and the grasses refer to this particular site. The artist is, uh, we'll see, I'm gonna take you into our exhibition um, featuring her work. She's very interested in the um, imagery of flowing water and specifically the power, destructive power and life force behind flowing water. And uh, this figure you can see, she stands 12 feet tall. She is pouring water out of a bucket and on top of her head, she balances a series of vessels. So pails and a pitcher. When you come on site and visit us, and just a few minutes ago, I was happy to see someone sitting in our courtyard and enjoying um, some sunshine and outdoor space. Um, but when you come to see, to visit us and see this uh, installation in person, you'll notice that there are some details embedded into the sculpture, including a cowrie shell, a clipper ship, a chain, and uh, some of these symbols refer to the Middle Passage and to West African culture. Alison Saar 
is very interested in the figure of uh, Yemaya or Yemaya. There are a number of pronunciations and spellings, the water goddess uh, associated with Yoruba culture and um, also represented in other cultures of the African diaspora. The flowing water here also refers to a flood that we had in this particular area in the San Antonio alluvial plain and the flood that she is specifically referring to took place in 1938. Uh, so there's a specific interest in the power of water and also making reference to our topography and um, our geological history here. So I will ask you to keep this figure in mind and um, I'll pause in case you have any questions about our building. Of course, many of you will have fond memories of the Williams College Museum of Art as I do. It is a great joy to be here at a, a very similar institution, a teaching institution, teaching museum embedded within a small liberal arts college. And we're very excited to activate this space and, and use it to provide greater access to our permanent collections. So I'll give you a full view, sort of straight Eastern view of our courtyard. And then um, I will turn us this way and take you to the north end of our building which is where we have our primary gallery suite. So I'm conducting this tour with the help of a rolling cart. We've decided over time that this is a better system than trying to use a handheld iPad or laptop. And I hope it's um, keeping you all from getting seasick as I move from one space to another. So I will move to the side and give you a view into um, two of the galleries in our primary gallery suite. This is, you're seeing um, through the space that we have allocated to this monographic exhibition featuring Alison Sars sculptures, prints, and paintings. This exhibition is realized in partnership with another institution here in Southern California, the Armory Center for the Arts. We co-organized this exhibition and the Armory is preparing to install their portion of it Given the ramifications of this COVID-19 pandemic, our plans have of course had to adjust and we are hoping that both installations will be on view and open to the public at the same time. But we have been delighted that we've at least had the chance to live with this installation um, fully realized since late October. And um, we are just so eager to open our doors so that more people can see it. I'm glad that all of you can at least get a sense of the amazing works that we have on view. The title of this exhibition is Alison Saar of Ether and Earth. And I'll just uh, show you here, this is our title wall to my left. It corresponds uh, with the design of our catalog. We're very proud of this catalog, which again was uh, realized in partnership with the Armory Center for the Arts. And um, our portion of this exhibition features approximately 15 works. I will drive you through the gallery so that we can look at a few of them in greater depth. So we have now approached uh, the sculpture that's titled Bitter Crop. And as you may have noticed from the cover of the catalog, this is indeed our um, cover image. 
And it, I think, is remarkable in the way that for its compact size, it still conveys a monumentality. As you'll see with a number of the works included in this exhibition, Sar is very interested in representing the female body and in rendering the female body in a powerful way. So these figures are often imbued with um, a sense of uh, force and agency. And she also um, embeds references to art history and literature throughout her works as well. This particular figure is sculpted from wood. So we can say it's a, a carved from wood then with additive features to create the hair. So um, all of the materials include wood, steel, bronze, acrylic, and tar. One of the things I find fascinating about Alison Sarr's work is the way that she has engaged with so many different materials, <clears throat> excuse me, so many different materials. And you'll see as we go through that she uses wood, she uses metal, she um, uses textiles as the support for her paintings and prints. She um, is very interested in found objects as well. And so we see an artist really exploring all the material properties um, that, she can, that she can access. Um, this particular figure also has an explicit reference to Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, and specifically the character of Topsy who is characterized um, in the novel as having a particular style of hair. And so here we see Alison Sarr um, creating this hairstyle and giving it this animate force. I um, personally just find this sculpture um, endlessly fascinating and uh, remarkable in the way that even in its relatively small scale, it um, conveys this monumental presence going to take you around the gallery to approach another work a little bit more safely so I don't have to try to steer through and among the other works in the exhibition. So we're going now, you're having a look through uh, the other half, you could say, of this primary suite of galleries. And you're going to get a little glimpse of a permanent collection exhibition that we developed with a group of student interns. And now I'm going to turn so we can approach another one of the works in this exhibition. So I'm going to go very carefully. So we are now looking at um, one of the older works included in this exhibition. The title of the piece is Scar Song, and it was created in 1989. Unlike the um, sculpture that we were just looking at, again, titled Bitter Crop and dated from 2018, this is a sculpture of uh, greater proportions. This is effectively a life-size life, uh, sculpture and it's made with very different materials. So um, there is a wooden armature, but it is primarily constructed of found copper rep repoussé, um, which means <clears throat> you know, thin metal sheets that have a pattern uh, created by pressing outward from the inside of the material to um, create a relief pattern. And uh, as I mentioned, the artist, Alison Sarr, has consistently been interested in sort of scavenging or salvaging, we could say. And the material that you see used in this sculpture is in fact the same material that was often used to adorn um, ceilings. So this is like ceiling, the equivalent of ceiling tin that she has now um, bent, uh, molded and fashioned to create this uh, very powerful female figure. 
we were, um, Rob Keenan and I were talking about this yesterday and I think Rob commented on the way that uh, this sculpture in particular evokes classical antiquity. And I would agree that in many ways, like um, the sculpture we were just talking about, Bitter Crop, how that work uh, recalls a sort of neoclassical reclining or recumbent female odalisque figures. Here, I think we see um, the a kind of um, very explicit reference to ancient warrior types uh, like the Gedi Kuros, for example, um, or other um, you know powerfully endowed male figures. So here, interesting choice to really engender uh, this female figure with that same sense of physical force. I'm taking you now into the second of our galleries devoted to this exhibition. And you will see the very first work I think is coming into view. This is another um, very large scale sculpture. So I have to position myself in the corner for you to be able to see the entire work. Um, but I think if you uh, still have in mind the sculpture that we recently installed here, our site specific sculpture, which is titled Imbue, you will see that this work um, has quite a bit in common in terms of uh, the form, in terms of um, also the use of these gathered materials. This work, of course, predates the sculpture that we recently installed. The title of this piece is Breach and it was completed in 2016. This sculpture is in the collection of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and we're delighted that they lent it to us, um, particularly now that the galleries where this uh, normally had been seen um, have been closed, and I think that building no longer exists. So we're delighted that it has um, a little, uh, you know, other, other opportunities to be out in the world here with us in Claremont, California. This piece, like uh, the imbue sculpture, also refers to flooding. And in this case, the sculpture was created shortly after Hurricane Katrina. So I hope you can see we have another standing female figure. Instead of pouring out a bucket, she's effectively uh, rowing or paddling. Uh, with a pole. She stands on a wooden pallet. That is part of the work. It is not um, something that we inserted to the work. And then you see a whole group of objects um, balanced on top of the figure's head. And again, we have the use of ceiling tin, just as in the Scar Song sculpture from many years earlier. Uh, we have the wood base, and then we also have found objects. So these are trunks, wash tubs, um, there's a ladle, a lantern. These are all objects that the artist found and repurposed for um, her own work. And I will take you through here, see if you can get perhaps a little different view with um, some lighting. And then I'll turn us around and you can see that we have also borrowed, in this case from the University of Kentucky Art Museum, uh, we borrowed a study for this work. So this uh, piece coming into view now is also titled Breach Study. And you see the idea for this figure rendered here um, and represented on seed sacks. So even in the case where, a, where Sar is making a drawing or a painting, she's still very interested in using found materials, found objects, and then repurposing them. And some of her, her recent prints also use uh, seed sacks, refashioned seed sacks as the printing support. So I am going to take us to our last port of call. And we're now um, leaving the Allison Sar exhibition. We see another work just behind me. This is titled Conked. And now we're coming into one of the other parts of the Alia Ali exhibition that I mentioned. I'm 
trying to stay out of the way so I don't block your view. This is a room installation that is titled The Red Star. And you can see that it includes wall painting with symbols. These are symbols of an invented language that the artist created in reference to the um, languages of Hebrew, Arabic, and Sabian. And she has illuminated these um, symbols with a black light. And so that's how we get this glowing effect. And in combination with this um, treatment of the walls in this in this space, which we did not necessarily intend to use as a gallery per se. We thought of this as um, perhaps in better intended to be a kind of lounge or reading room. Um, but the artist was so intrigued by the space that she um, convinced us to use it for this purpose. And so in addition to the wall painting, you also see a four channel film um, and it has its own title, which is Machjar. So the installation altogether is called the Red Star and that refers to the planet Mars, um, which people of Yemeni descent, like the artist herself, have uh, particular associations with because of uh, Yemeni um, myths connecting the queen of Saba or Sheba uh, to the planet Mars. So some of what you hear is in fact a sound that was recorded on Mars by NASA uh, combined with footage that the artist uh, recorded herself and also found footage uh, documenting the uh, conflict in Yemen, which I believe is now approaching its seven year anniversary. Victoria, it's Rob. Uh, so are, the, are the, the video images of the two screens that are perpendicular, are those, I mean, are those connected or are those yeah, separate? Yes, so these are, there, um, there are four screens total. So there's the um, principal screen at the end of the gallery. And then this is a narrow space. I'll try to, so what we did, these are actually all four of these uh, screens are actually apertures. Normally they would be windows showing natural light. And in this case, we've blacked them out. I'm gonna walk the length of the gallery now and try to give you a sense of this. Um, so we used blackout shades and then we have four projectors projecting the four channel film, um, which in some cases is continuous. So between, especially in these, uh, in the corner, there are these two screens at different moments in the film, which runs about 14 minutes. Uh, sometimes these two screens are continuous one with each other, and sometimes they're separate images. So it was, in fact, quite a bit of work to make what is normally a light-filled space completely blacked out. Um, but we, we feel that it was worth it because it, it is um, quite an impressive effect. So here's, for example, one of the moments where these, these two images are continuous with each other, whereas the other two screens are not. So let me know. I'm happy to stay in here. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. I may um, walk out of here so we have a little bit more light and um, would be happy to go back to one of the spaces that we were in. As I mentioned, this is, this is in fact our largest gallery and we have on view now a selection from our permanent collection, which comprises some 15,000 objects. While we're waiting for questions, I'll just show you the book that we produced um, as part of the Ali Ali exhibition. 
in some ways we consider this really the fifth part of the exhibition. You've seen all that is installed of this show here now. We have the entrance lobby, the flux series in the art hall, this room installation, the film that's online. Um, and then this book is really remarkable. It's actually sort of an artist book where you see that the pages are actually different sizes and printed on different types of paper. Um, so there's almost like a little booklet set within the booklet. Um, so we've been really pleased with how this particular publication has turned out. And that is one of the features of the series, the project series. It's often the first opportunity that an artist has to have a publication dedicated to their work. It's amazing. Uh, Victoria, it's Rob again. Could I uh, ask him, because my, my, um, my daughter's a recent grad from Williams, but she was, was watching as well. We were, we were wondering about the, um, the ether and earth. I mean, did, I mean is that, did the artist provide the, t the, the title or is that something that you guys did in terms of the cura creation? I, think because, the, I mean, the, the anagrams yeah, is really, the, really interesting. Yeah, so the, the title refers to alchemy and um, sort of early, early modern understanding of the elements. And I believe that the uh, title emerged really in conversation with the artist and our two curators. As I mentioned, it's uh, co-organized with the Armory Center for the Arts. And I think the title really came about in one of those magical brainstorm moments. But um, just as the artist, Alison Sarr is very interested in the properties of all these different materials that she works with. So, you know, wood, tin, found objects, textiles, paper. Um, she's also interested in, in the specific properties of different elements. And, and our exhibition really features the element of water as you um, could perceive. And our partners, the Armory Center for the Arts will have works that refer more explicitly to fire and earth. Um, so, that was certainly in 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 mind as they came up with the title. Gotcha. All right. Well, we do have a question with chat. You got you going to do it, Keenan? Yeah. So we have a question from Catherine Price. Uh, hi, Katie. By the way, how does your background in early modern art history inform your work as a director at the Benton, a college teaching museum on a liberal arts campus? Thank you. Hi, Katie. Thanks for thanks for joining us. I can't wait for you to visit here in person. Our collection, as I mentioned, does have uh, about 15,000 objects. You probably can't quite see, but right where I'm pointing, there is a painting with a triangular um, format at the top, and that is uh, the center, center panel of an altarpiece. So we do have works in our collection in terms of chronological period that fall within my area of specialization. But I think I've, um, you know, starting with my time at Williams and studying uh, the history of prints and printmaking with Jim Gantz, who was a curator at the Clark Art Institute and um, an instructor in our program. I have been so devoted to works on paper, uh, prints, drawings, and photographs. We have about 5,000 works on paper in our collection, and anyone who goes into that field tends to be a generalist at heart. We like to um, learn new things all the time. So I think that that training and that background um, kind of, you know, prepare me to just uh, delight in the, the curiosity and the opportunity to pursue lifelong learning on the job, as it were. We have another question from Andrea G. I don't want to miss, uh, miss that up. So I'll just say Andrea Girodi. G. Sorry, Andrea. Girodi is what I would, would say. It's, it's going to be hard. To Her question is, how much have students and faculty been able to access the museum this year to see these fantastic shows? And a bigger question, what's on the horizon for the museum in terms of exhibitions and other initiatives? Thank you for the question. And hello, I think we were together at um, Mark Hackstausen's celebration. So I'm so glad that you could be with us. 
Of course, it's it's been a frustrating time, as I'm sure it has been um, for others as well. I began working here a little bit more than a year ago, and of course, we, like everywhere else, we were in session. The building was completed, construction was complete in 2019. And so we did have our students come in. I um, The exhibition that you see here, I um, supervised a group of students who developed the checklist uh, with, with us. So they did come, they were able to come into our vaults to select some works for the checklist. We wanted to, the title of this exhibition is called In Our Care, Institutional History in Material Form. We wanted to give a sense of the breadth of our holdings. You may see um, here in the distance, a group of Kawea baskets. So the formational gifts to our collection were in fact gifts of Native American art. And uh, we wanted to try to represent the breadth of our holdings, which as I said, include works on paper. So I think there's some Goya prints um, behind me. This big square is uh, half of the Disparate series by Goya. And, um, and then these monumental paintings representing our strength in um, 20th century Southern California um, artistic production. But uh, we barely got the collections into the building before uh, we had to kind of, you know, close down our operations. And we have carried on our internship program just through remote means. So I don't know if you can see along the lower edge of this room, we have a timeline, institutional timeline that was researched by our students. Um, we've had student gallery talks kind of using the same rig that I am using here today. Um, we'll have someone from the museum um, broadcast from the galleries and then students join us through Zoom and give a gallery talk to present their work that way. Um, and then the galleries I'm not showing you, we have smaller independent galleries and, and those are two exhibitions that are um, that were completely generated by students with um, some supervision from curatorial staff. <clears throat> We've decided to extend those exhibitions so that they will be open in September when we expect our students to be back in residence. And so we hope that that at least those exhibitions will be um, on view when our full campus community is reassembled. Part of why I wanted to really feature uh, the Allison Saar and Ali Ali exhibitions today is that they will close um, at some point over the summer or even in the late spring. And, um, you know, that's just can't can't be helped because of our other commitments to exhibition programs next year. And to, to try to answer that, we do have our um, exhibition calendar in development. There's another gallery that you won't see that has a, a light installation by Pomona alumna Helen Pashkin that will stay on view through 2021. And um, in the spaces that you just saw, the Allison Saar space and part this um, room with the film installation by Ali Ali, we will be showing work from artists um, all affiliated with Hiroshima City University and that will open in September. The exhibition is titled um, Every Day the Sun Rises. So um, that's what we are looking forward to and um, to welcoming our students and faculty and community members back on site and inside our walls. A question for me, Victoria. <laughs> Um, I know this is your first directorship, and again, congratulations. I'm just wondering, you know, COVID notwithstanding, what has been, you know, some of the big surprises for you in this first directorship? Well, I was really fortunate to complete the Center for Curatorial Leadership program that you mentioned, and that provided a great training and a lot of um, support through the network of that program, CCL. I think there's a good representation of Williams alums in that program as well. I think what surprised me, and this is probably the result of um, the impact of COVID is how much energy we would devote to our communication efforts. 
I sort of imagined, you know, we would be focused more on developing, right, the exhibition program, collection development, activating the collection um, for teaching purposes. But in a moment where we can't bring people inside our space, we have uh, dedicated study rooms that um, I hope you will all see on another, in another event or on a visit. Um, but I, you know, in the absence of those opportunities, the museum to some extent exists as an idea. And so how do you communicate the idea of a new museum in our particular geographic location, a teaching museum within a college setting. Um, so we've created some films. We have a short form documentary film that you can see on our website devoted to the Allison Saar installation. We're completing a film related to the Alia Ali exhibition. Um, we de developed a podcast, the student produ produced podcast. So it's called Inside the Benton and you can find it on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and that's been a lot of fun. And we've done that all through remote means. We did um, hatch the idea in person, but now we've carried that out uh, remotely. And so it's um, been a bit of a surprise just how much time and, and focus goes into the communication sphere. I guess that's what I would say. Awesome. Well, Keenan, thank you um, for organizing. And Victoria, thanks so much for the tour. Um, it really is amazing. I, I you know, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at you in the amazing museum. I'm looking out my window in a blizzard, so I'm very jealous of you guys out in Southern California today. We but, actually um, had some. We had some snow yesterday, Rob. If you can <laughs> believe it. But uh, but uh, no, we really appreciate you doing this amazing tour for for folks and. We would love to do a, a proper, you know, in-person event at some point. You know, at some point, we'll, we're hoping in the fall we'll be given the green light to be, you know, I assume, you know, Pomona must be the same. You know, you have to be appropriately cautious um, in terms of gatherings. But uh, mm -hmm. so congratulations on, on the position. And like I said, it's, uh, we look forward to, to being able to, uh, to circle back with you at some point uh, for a proper event. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for joining me and we can't wait to welcome you here on the premises and I'll, I'll just close us out with a final view back in, in our dramatic black, black lit room, but thanks again for, for making the time.